I'm going to <clears throat> direct this, I believe, to um, Mr. Grush, but if any of you all feel like you need to jump in, just jump right in. We're good. Um, has the U.S. government become aware of actual evidence of extraterrestrial, otherwise unexplained forms of intelligence? And if so, when do you think this first occurred? Uh, I like to use the term non-human. I don't like to denote origin. Keeps the aperture open, both scientifically. Right. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, like I've dis discussed publicly uh, previously, 1930s. Okay. Can you give me the names and titles of the people with direct first-hand knowledge uh, and access to some of this crash retrieval, some of these crash retrieval programs, and maybe which facilities, military bases that would the recovered material would be in? And I know a lot of Congress have talked about we're going to go to Area 51, and you know, and there's nothing there anymore anyway. It's just you know, and we move like a glacier. And as soon as we announce it, I'm sure the moving vans would pull up. But please. Uh, I can't discuss that publicly, but I did provide that information both to the Intel committees and the Inspector General. And we could get that in the SCIF if we were allowed to get in a SCIF with you. Would that be probably what you would think? Sure, if you had the appropriate yeah. accesses, yeah. Uh, what special access programs cover this information, and how is it possible that they have evaded oversight for so long? Uh, I do know the names. Once again, I can't discuss that publicly and, and how they've evaded oversight. I. In a closed setting, I can tell you the specific tradecraft use. All right. When do, when do you think those programs began and who authorized them? I do know a lot of that information, but that's something I can't discuss publicly because of sensitivities. All right. If any of y'all want to jump in on any of this, you're more than welcome to. Um, what level of security clearance is required to fully access these programs? Well, anybody who has... Uh, and, I, and I say that oh. because myself... Um, Representative Gates and Representative Luna were mm -hmm. basically turned away at one point mm -hmm. at Eglin. So please go right ahead. Uh, certainly, difference between member access and say somebody like me, but anybody who has a you know TSSCI clearance and meets the eligibility criteria, the access adjudicative authority should be able to grant you access. So, yeah. uh, Ms. Bircher, if you'll yield. So just to be put a fine point on that, there's nothing that you're aware of that's above special access program classification. It's a misnomer that there's anything actually above top secret. Executive Order 13526 delineates the classification levels. Right. And, but I, I draw a point on that because we can have access mm -hmm. to, to those programs. And so the notion that we're not being given that access sort of defies our typical muscle memory here in Congress. Thank you, Mr. Burchard. I'll yield back to you. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Um, along those lines, Title 10, you might not know this or not, but uh, Title 10 and Title 50 authorization as they, they seem to say they're inefficient. It, so who gets to decide this, in your opinion, in the past? Uh, it's a group of career uh, senior executive officials. Okay. Are they government officials? Both or in and out. Do what? Both in and out of government, and that's about as far as I, I can go there. Yeah. All right. Well, that's, that leads to my next question. Which private corporations are directly involved in this program? How much taxpayer money has been invested in these programs, to your knowledge? I mean, we know we, know we, we audit the Pentagon every year, mm -hmm. and I've been here five years, and they failed the dadgum thing every year. They uh, lose over a billion dollars a year, we think, and I was told the Department of Defense maybe 60% of their assets are unaccounted for, whatever the heck that means. In the public sector, you go to jail for that kind of crap. So tell me. Yeah, I know when I, um, I'm, I'm a dollar off of my DTS travel voucher, I get hammered, but it uh, seems like it doesn't work the other if way, you right? Sell over yeah. six, if you sell over $600 worth of stuff on eBay, now you get a call from the IRS. So, mm -hmm. please, what corporations? Yeah, I don't know the specific metrics towards the end of your question. Uh, the specific corporations I did provide uh, to the committees in specific divisions, and uh, I spent 11 and a half hours with both Intel committees. So. Okay, has there been any... Has there been an active U.S. government disinformation campaign to deny the existence of unidentified aerial phenomena? And if so, why? I can't go beyond what I've already espoused publicly about that. Okay, I've been told to ask you what that what that is and how to get it in the record. What, which, which, uh, what have you stated publicly in your interviews for the congressional record? Uh, 
Yeah. If you uh, reference my News Nation interview and I talk about a multi-decade, you know, campaign to um, disenfranchise public interest, Sorry, basically. Yeah. Thank you. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I yield back negative 21 seconds. Thank you. Ms. Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for coming here today. Um, I do concur with the ranking member as well as several other members here on this committee that uh, this is a committee for whistleblowers and for the protection of whistleblowers as well. So we understand uh, what you're putting um, on the table here and what you're putting on the line here, and we thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Grush, you sat on the Unidentified Anomalous Phenomenon Task Force created in the 2020 NDAA, correct? Yes. Uh, there have been some things that... Uh, that have been mentioned here during this hearing that I wanted to pick up on. Um, Mr. Graves, you mentioned specifically during the answers to one of your questions, you named Boeing contractors um, being engaged in an incident regarding this red cube about a football, um, a football field wide. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the interaction or Mr. Grush, either of you, the interactions between defense contractor companies and any UAP related programs or activities. So I'll just say that the information about uh, the contractor themselves were provided by a witness, and I have no particular Understood. detail in that relationship. Mr. Grish. Uh, the kind of general unclass wave tops, uh, certainly the contractors, you know, are the metal benders, so to speak, mm -hmm. the ones actually uh, doing specific uh, performance on government contracts. Are they required um, to issue any disclosure regarding UAP sightings, or do they engage in any uh, reporting around this? Uh, in terms of the contractors? Yes. Not that I'm aware of. They do not. Okay. Now, when it comes to notification that you had mentioned about um, IRAP pro IRAD programs, we have seen uh, defense contractors abuse uh, their contracts before through this committee. Um, I have seen it personally, um, and I have also seen the notification requirements to Congress abused. Um, I am wondering... One of the loopholes that we see in the law is that there is, at least from my vantage point, is that depending on what we're seeing is that there are no actual definitions or requirements for notification. Are there, what methods of notification did you observe? Like when they say they notified Congress, how did they do that? Do you have insight into that? Uh, for certain IRAD activities, uh, and I, uh, I can only think of ones conventional in nature. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they thro uh, flow through certain, I would say, SAP programs that have cognizant authority over uh, the Air Force or something. And those are congressionally reported compartments. But IRAD is literally internal to the contractor. Mm -hmm. So as long as it's money, either profits, private investment, et cetera. And they to, can do whatever they want. To put a yeah. finer point on yeah. it, when there is a requirement for any agency or company to notify, or any agency to notify Congress, do they contact the chairman of a committee? Do they get them on the phone specifically? Is this through an email to hypothetically a dead email box? Uh, a lot of it comes through what they call the PPR, periodic program review process. Mm -hmm. If it's a, you know, a SAP or controlled access program equity, and then those go to the specific committees, whether it be the SAS, okay. CASC, HISI. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I apologize. I, I just, my time is limited. Um, it, Mr. Graves, one of your main concerns is that the FAA currently does not have an official process to receive reports of UAP from pilots or others, correct? Correct. And um, in your experience, what data should the Aero program prioritize for potential collection? We have, you know, location, date, time, but are there other specific uh, characteristics that should be included in these reports? Certainly. Uh, I think that there's two categories that would be important. Uh, one would be kinematics and understanding the specifics of how the vehicle or objects are moving. Uh, and the second would be a more zoomed out approach of being able to uh, look at origin and destination uh, after or before the incident, as well as getting a better contextual understanding of how these, uh, these objects are interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, I, I, because I only have a minute left, I apologize, we only have five minutes today, but um, for the record, if you were me, where would you look? Titles, programs, departments, regions, if you could just name anything. Um, and I, I put that as an open question to the three of you. I'd be happy to give you that in a closed environment. I can tell you specifically. Thank you. Um, Commander Fravor. And I would say, and I've told people that you, you have to know where to look. They're not gonna divulge it to you. 
because of the classification levels. But if you know where to look and who to talk to, which is exactly where Mr. Gresh can point you, then you then you have them. Okay. Mr. Graves? I was an operator, so I was depending on folks like Mr. Garage to do that homework. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back to the chair. Mr. Biggs? Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses for being here today. I'm over here. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I want to get into uh, specifics here, and, and the reason I'm going to go this way is because you've talked a bit about um, what I would call misdirection by um, official U.S. government with regard to UAPs, right? And so I'm going to get to that in a second. But last week, White House NSC spokesman John Kirby stated that UAPs are having an impact on our training ranges and need to be treated as a legitimate issue. Do you concur with the statements? That's for each of you. Yes. 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 Okay. Um, now, having said that, I'm going to take you to specific instances around the Phoenix Valley, because that's where I, I live. And in 97, we had the famous Phoenix Light case. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. Uh, there, were, there were two things that went along with that, and the explanation was military training range off Luke and the Barry Goldwater range. Do you know anything different other than the official explanation of those lights? Only what's in the public vernacular about it. That was outside the scope of my duties. And if we wanted to, just my question along with my colleague from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, if we wanted to find out more about that, where would we go to find the files, and where and who would we address? And are you going to tell me we need to go to a skiff so you can tell us in a skiff? <laughs> I could potentially give you a vector on that. Uh, that specific case, I'm not. I mean, I'm familiar with it in terms of public, but uh, I, I, I give you a vector in a closed environment. Yeah, Th that would be good. Thank you. So, if if it's true that UAPs are having an impact on training ranges and this administration considers it to be a legitimate issue, what steps can Congress take to address training range impacts? And I say that having two very large training ranges in my state. And so we'll start with Mr. Graves and going down the, the panel. Some of the initial procedures have been implemented, uh, such as within the United States Navy that have a range follow report that gathers information from pilots. Uh, I understand that a service-wide reporting mechanism is still pending. However, that would be a great next step, not only for gathering information, but for showing the troops that it is an acceptable topic and reducing the stigma. Is, okay, please, all of you continue. Yeah, as a recipient of a lot of those training range reports, uh, sometimes we only get contextual kind of um, oral uh, reporting. It'd be nice if they attached all sensor data and there's a system in place that can handle multiple classifications okay. of data. And that's an issue with the F-35, right? That jet was never right. built to be an ISR platform. Right. And it's a pain in the, we'll say, butt uh, to get that data off. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree with the previous two being a user of those training ranges uh, that the data has to be out there. You have to acknowledge that you're seeing them, and then you have to collect the data. Right now, you get the report. Someone says, I saw something, but no one collects the radar data to, to, to back it up and do research. Okay. Uh, do you believe that the 2019 classification guidelines for UAPs interferes with the federal government's ability to be transparent with the American people? And do you think we need to be more transparent with the American people? All of you, yeah. I'll, I'll say yes to that. Yeah, I'm familiar with the, the, at least the UAP Task Force 2019 uh, Security Classification right. Guide. Uh, I think it's fair. Um, I did actually help uh, author that with the uh Oh, you got, you got a bias that yeah, way then. <laughs> but I will say, uh, I'll call it a lazy attitude about declassifying videos. I mean, I've seen some of the videos of uh, you know, the recent shoot down, and I saw no reason that couldn't have been released as long as they mask you know, some data. Uh, the American people deserve to see that, that imagery and, and full motion video. Uh, I would think, well, in my opinion, I will say things are overclassified. I know for a fact the video or the pictures that came out in the 20, I think it was 2020 report that had the stuff off the East Coast, they were taken with an iPhone off the East Coast. A buddy of mine was one of the senior people there, and he said they were originally classified at TSSCI. And my question to him was, what's TSSCI about these? They're an iPhone right. literally off the vacapes. That's not TSSCI. So they're overclassified, and as soon as they do that, they go in a vault, and then you all have to look for them. Yeah, so with the overclassification, that may be one way. Are there other ways that the uh, DOD or intelligence agencies are, 
uh, keeping this information from the American people or even from Congress? I think part of that has been uh, not encouraging reporting. Uh, if the problem is not something that can be measured, it's not something that's going to be fixed. Okay. Very good. Well, I'm out of time, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Uh, first of all, without objection, Representative Nick Langworthy of New York has waived on the subcommittee for purpose of questioning witnesses at today's subcommittee hearing. And then we go to Mr. Burleson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, appreciate you guys coming out today testifying look I've been here for six months and I'm pretty skeptical I don't trust anything in this town and um, and so I and I think that's because I'm from Missouri you've got to show me right um, with that being said um, there's been a lot of things that have been said um, in in the public uh, mr. Grush and and so I want to get down to if we can some specifics right so um, at one point, you had said that there, 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 there uh, has been harmful activity or aggressive activity. Mm -hmm. Has any of the activity um, been aggressive, been um, hostile to, in your reports? Uh, I know of multiple colleagues of mine that got physically injured. And uh, the activity... And I gotta, I by, to... by UAPs or by, by people within the, the federal government? Both. Okay, so there has been activity by, by alien or non-human non technology and or beings that has caused harm to humans. Uh, I can't get into the specifics in a, an open environment, but at least the activity that I personally witnessed, and I have to be very careful here, because uh, you don't, you know, they tell you never to acknowledge tradecraft, right? So what I personally witnessed myself and my wife was very disturbing. Okay. Um, one of my constituents actually sent this next question, and I figured I'd ask it since I had the same thought. You've said that the U.S. In has intact space spacecraft. You said that the government has alien bodies or alien species. Have you seen, have you, have you seen the spacecraft? I have to be careful to describe what I've seen uh, firsthand and not in this environment, but I, I could answer that question behind, behind closed doors. Yeah. And have you seen any of the bodies? That's something I've, I've not uh, witnessed myself. Okay. And so with that being said, you know, and the other, other statement that has been made that was intriguing to me because, and it's intriguing because my, my view has been that we are billions of light years away from any, any other system. And the concept that an alien species that's technologically advanced enough to travel billions of light years gets here and somehow is incompetent enough to not survive Earth or crashes is, is something that I find a little bit far-fetched. And with that being said, you have mentioned that there's interdimensional p potential. Could you expound on that? I'll get to answer your first question, and you know I'm here as a fact witness and expert, but I, I will give you a, a theoretical framework at least to work off to kind of espouse uh, crashes, uh, regardless of uh, you know your level of sentience, right? You know planes crash, cars crash, n number of sorties, what, however high, a small percentage are going to end in you know mission failure, if you will, as we say in the, in the Air Force, uh, and then in terms of uh, multi-dimensionality, that kind of thing, the the framework. Uh, that I'm familiar with, for example, is something called the holographic principle. Uh, both uh, it's, it derives itself from general relativity and uh, quantum mechanics. And that is, if you want to imagine uh, a 3D object such as yourself casting a shadow onto a 2D surface, uh, that's the holographic principle. So you can be projected, quasi-projected from higher dimensional space to lower dimensional. It's a scientific trope that you can actually cross, literally, as far as I understand, but there's probably guys of PhDs that we could probably but, argue about that. But you have yeah. not seen any documentation that that's what's occurring? Uh, only a theory. theoretical framework discussion. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Occam's razor my, is that this, these aircraft, um, ha, have they been identified that they are being produced by, by domestic um, you know, military and, um, contractors? Is there any evidence that that's what's being recovered? Uh, not to my knowledge. Plus, the recoveries predate a lot of our advanced programs that I previously am witting of. So, 
Um, would it be safe to say that there could be a scenario today where you have um, an aircraft that crashes and because it's been involved in one program from one federal agency and the but the but the agency that retrieves it does is not aware of that program and to them it, it appears alien in origin I mean that's a hypothetical situation I'm not aware of any uh, historical situation that would match that that you described so you're not aware it has not happened that you're aware of that I'm aware of um, thank you mr. chairman I yield back Several months ago, my office received a protected disclosure from Eglin Air Force Base indicating that there was a UAP incident that required my attention. I sought a briefing regarding that episode and brought with me Congressman Burchett and Congresswoman Luna. We asked to see any of the evidence that had been taken by flight crew in this endeavor and to observe any radar signature uh, as, long as, as well as to meet with the flight crew. We were not afforded access to all of the flight crew. And initially, we were not afforded access to images and to radar. Thereafter, we had a bit of a discussion about how authorities flow in the United States of America, and we did see the image. And we did meet with one member of the flight crew who took the image. The image was of something that I am not able to attach to any human capability, either from the United States or from any of our adversaries. And I'm somewhat informed on the matter, having served on the Armed Services Committee for seven years, having served on the committee that oversees DARPA and advanced technologies for several years. Um, when we spoke with the flight crew, and when he showed us the photo that he'd taken, I asked why the video wasn't engaged, why we didn't have a FLIR system that worked. Here's what he said. They were out on a test mission that day over the Gulf of Mexico, and when you're on a test mission, you're supposed to have clear airspace, not supposed to be anything that shows up. And they saw a sequence of four craft in a clear diamond formation for which there is uh, a radar sequence that I and I alone have observed in the United States Congress. One of the pilots goes to check out that diamond formation and sees a large floating, what I can only describe as an orb, Again, like I said, not of any human capability that I'm, that I'm aware of. And when he approached, he said that his radar went down, he said that his FLIR system malfunctioned, and that he had to manually take this image um, from one of the lenses, and it was not automatic, automated uh, in collection, as you would typically see in a test mission. So uh, I guess I'll start with Commander Fravor. In, how should we think about the fact that this craft that was approached by our pilot uh, had the capability of disarming a number of the sensor and collection systems on that craft? Well, I think this goes to that national security side, and you can go back through history of things showing up at certain areas and disabling our capabilities, which is disheartening. And for us, I mean, like I said, it, it completely disabled the radar on the aircraft when it tried to do it, and the only way we could see it is passively, which is how he got that image. So I think that's a, that's a concern on what are these doing, not only how do they operate, but their capabilities inside to do things like this. And, and how should we think about forecraft moving in a very clear formation, equidistant from one another, um, in a diamond? In all of the phenomenon, perhaps, Mr. Grave, that you've analyzed, um, have we ever seen multiple craft in a, in a single formation? I have one particular case, and that was uh, during the gimbal incident. Um, the recording on the AT FLIR system shows a single object that rotates. Um, you hear the pilots refer to a, a fleet of objects that is not visible on the FLIR system, and, and that was something that I witnessed during the debrief as part of the radar data on the situational awareness page. I would like to add, however, Congressman, uh, there's a small, uh, small bit of uh, uh, anger, I would say, I would feel that those pilots are still uh, facing that difficulty in reporting this topic and they don't have the tools to be able to mitigate this issue. It just goes to show how serious this is and why this is such an important issue for our pilots and for our nation. It was stated explicitly to me by these test pilots 
that if you have a U of AP experience, the best thing you can do for your career is forget it and not tell anyone. Because any type of reporting, either above the surface or below the surface, uh, does have a perceived consequence to these people. And that is a culture we must change if we want to get to the truth. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I would observe that perhaps as we, uh, as we move forward from this hearing, there are some obvious next steps. Every person watching this knows that we need to meet with Mr. Grush in a secure compartmentalized facility so that we can get fulsome answers that do not put him in jeopardy and that, and that give us the information we need. Second, I would suggest that the radar images from, um, that were collected of this formation of craft out of Eglin Air Force Base, and specifically the actual image taken by the actual flight crew that we can actually validate um, be provided to the committee, subpoenaed if necessary, um, so that we're able to track how to get this type of reporting and analysis done in a more fulsome way. That would be my recommendation, humbly, as a guest here of the Fine Oversight Committee. I yield back. Ms. Mays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to our witnesses who are testifying today. I want to thank each of you for being here to discuss a topic of grave importance to our national security. Earlier this year, a Chinese spy balloon was shot down off the coast of my home state of South Carolina. Since the Roswell incident in 1947, many Americans have wondered about the dangers of unknown objects crisscrossing our skies. Whether these are UAPs or weather phenomena, advanced technology from American allied or enemy forces or something more out of this world. So my first question, I have several questions and I'll, I, if we can just be quick on these first two, I'm going to ask each of you the same question um, and then I'll get to each of you individually. Uh, the first one, when you reported your experiences with a UAP, did any of you face any repercussions with your superiors, yes or no? No. No. I've actually never seen anything personally, believe it or not. So. <laughs> All right. Um, and then do, do you believe there's an active disinformation campaign within our government to deny existence of UAPs, yes or no? I don't have an answer to that. As previ previously stated publicly, yes. I think previously with like Project Blue Book, yes, but currently I don't speak for the United States government. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions for Mr. Graves. Um, what percentage of UAP sightings, in your belief, go unreported by our pilots? This is an approximation based off of my personal experience speaking with a number of pilots, but uh, I would estimate we're somewhere near 5% reporting, perhaps. So like 95% basically don't report seeing UAPs. That's just my personal estimate. Um, in the incident off Virginia Beach, do you believe the Navy took the danger to your aircraft seriously after it was reported? Absolutely. Um, a few questions for Mr. Favor. As an expert naval aviator, have you ever seen an object that looked and moved like the Tic Tac UAP? No. Did the Tic Tac UAP move in such a way that defied the laws of physics? The way we understand them, yes. Many dismiss UAP reports as classified weapons testing by our own government, but in your experience as a pilot, does our government typically test advanced weapon systems right next to multi-million dollar jets without informing our pilots? No, we have test ranges for that. It took over 15 years for your encounter with the Tic Tac to be declassified. Do you feel there was a good reason to prevent lawmakers from having access to this footage? No, I just think it was ignored when it happened, and it just sat somewhere in a file. Never got reported. In a drawer. It happens a lot up here. <laughs> Shocker. Um, Mr. Grush, a couple of questions for you, too, sir, this morning. Um, what percentage of UAPs do you feel are adequately investigated by the U.S. government? Of the 5% that are reported. <laughs> um, I can only speak for uh, my personal leadership over at NGA. I tried to look at every report that came through that mm -hmm. I could triage, so... Do you believe that officials at the highest levels of our national security apparatus have unlawfully withheld information from Congress and subverted uh, our oversight authority? There are certain elected leaders that had more information that I'm not sure what they've shared with certain Gang of Eight members or et cetera, but uh, certainly uh, I would not be surprised. Okay. You've stated that the government is in possession of potentially non-human spacecraft. Based on your experience and extensive conversations with experts, do you believe our government has made contact with intelligent extraterrestrials? Something I can't discuss in public setting. 
Um, okay, I can't ask when you think this occurred. <laughs> um, if you believe we have crashed craft, uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Um, were they, I guess, human or non-human biologics? Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. And was this documentary evidence, this video, photos, eyewitness? Like, how would that be determined? The specific documentation I would have to talk to you in a skiff about. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and, and you may or may not be able to answer my last question, and maybe we get into a skiff at the next hearing that we have, but who in the government either, what agency, sub-agency, what contractors, who should be called into the next hearing about UAPs, either in a public setting or even in a private setting? And, and you probably can't name names, but what agencies or organizations, contractors, et cetera, do we need to call in to get these questions answered, whether it's about funding, what programs are happening, and what's out there? I can give you a specific cooperative and hostile witness list of specific individuals uh, that were in those. And, and how soon can we get that list? I'm happy to provide that to you after the hearing. Super. Thank you. And I yield back. Okay, now we have Mr. Langworthy's here. Okay. Thank you there very you. much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of the witnesses for being here today uh, to discuss this very unique topic. Uh, and I'd like to jump right into my questions, if you don't mind. Uh, Commander Fravor, can you briefly describe your background? Yeah, I was an enlisted Marine, Naval Academy graduate, Navy flew for 18 years, got a master's from University of Houston, uh, and I've worked in the private sector for the last, what now, 19, 16 years, 17 years. I do a lot of defense work. So. Re really gold-plated credentials. Uh, Commander Fravor, have, uh, we have all seen the floating Tic Tac video uh, that you engage with on uh, November 14th, 2004. Can you briefly talk about why you were off the coast of San Diego that day? Yeah, we were at a workup with all the battle groups, so we integrate the ships with the carrier, the air wing with the carrier, and we start working. So we were doing an air-to-air -air defense to hone not only our skills, but those of the USS Princeton when they had been tracking them for two weeks. The problem was that there was never manned aircraft airborne when they were tracking them, and this was the first day, and unfortunately, we were the ones airborne and went and saw it. Do you remember the weather that day? Was it cloudy or windy or anything out of the ordinary on the Pacific coast? It was actually, if, if you're familiar with San Diego, it was a perfect day, light winds, no white caps, clear skies, not a cloud. It was, for flying, it was the best. Now, is it true that you saw, in your words, a 40-foot flying tic-tac-shaped <coughs> object? That's correct. Or for some people that can't know what a tic-tac is, it's a giant flying propane tank. Fair enough. Did this object come up on radar or interfere with your radar or the USS Princeton? The Princeton tracked it, the Nimitz tracked it, the E-2 tracked it. We never saw it on our radars. Our fire control radars never picked it up. The other airplane that took the video did get it on a radar. As soon as it tried to lock it, it jammed the radar, spit the lock, and he, he rapidly switched over to the targeting pod, which he can do in the, uh, the F-18. From what you saw that day and what you've seen on video, did you see any source of propulsion from the flying object, including on any potential th thermal scans from your aircraft? No, there's none. There's no uh, IR plume coming out. Uh, and Chad, who took the video, went through all the EO, which is black and white TV, and the IR modes, and there's no visible signs of propulsion. It's just sitting in space at 20,000 feet. In, in your career, have you ever seen a propulsion system that creates no thermal exhaust? No. Can you describe how the aircraft maneuvered? Uh, abruptly, uh, very determinate. It knew exactly what it was doing. It was aware of our presence, and it had acceleration rates. I mean, it went from zero to matching our speed in no time at all. Now, if the fastest plane on Earth was trying to do these maneuvers that you saw, would it be capable of doing that? No, not even close. And just to confirm, this object had no wings, correct? No wings. Now, was the aircraft that you were flying, was it armed? No, never felt threatened at all. If, if the aircraft was armed, do you believe that your aircraft or any aircraft in possession of the United States could have shot the Tic Tac down? I'd say no, 
just on the performance, it would just left in a, in a split second. It looks like that we have a problem here that needs further investigation. <laughs> yes. Uh, in your belief, is this this flying tic tac? I mean, is this is it capable of being the product of any other nation on the earth? No, I actually I said, like I said earlier, I think it defies current material science and the ability to develop that much propulsion. And I, I know there's been some physicists have done calculations, which is beyond anything that we have. Well, either the United States has an adversary here in this world that we don't know, or we really have some serious investigations to do. I, I really appreciate you being here. Um, is there anything else about the November 14th, 2004 incident that you think is important for this committee to know that you haven't been asked here today? No, I, I, you know, it's, it's been said it's probably the most credible UFO sighting in history based on all the sensors that were tracking it, and then for us to get visual and to go against the naysayers that it's something on the screen or whatever. I mean, there's four sets of human eyeballs. We're all very credible. Of the six of us that were involved in the thing, including the video, every one of us is going to do 20-plus years in the military in very responsible positions. So I'd say the world needs to know that. This, it's not a joke. No, thank you very much for your testimony here today for all of you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ellis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you all for being here and the courage it took to come forward and, and again, the sacrifice that each of you have made. Um, I serve on the National Security Subcommittee for the Financial Services Committee, so I really want to stay in the national security lane, uh, if I may. Um, so when we think about traditional adversaries and uh, both us – uh, towards them and them towards us, you know, we probe uh, their capabilities. We look for weaknesses, uh, and we, we collect that data, that reconnaissance for in the, in the event we need it in the future. Um, for each of you, yes or no question, based off of your own experience or the data that you've been privy to, is there any indication that these UAPs could be uh, essentially uh, collecting reconnaissance information? Mr. Graves? Yes. Mr. Grush? Fair assessment, yeah. Mr. That's Fravor? Very possible. Again, in the national security vein, uh, is it possible that these UIPs would be probing our capabilities? Yes or no, Mr. Graves? Yes. Grush? Yes. Fravor? Definitely. Is it possible that these UAPs are testing for vulnerabilities in our current systems? Yes. Yes. Possible. Do you feel, based off of your experience and the information that you've been privy to, that these UAP, UAPs uh, provide uh, an existential threat to the national security of the United States? Mr. Graves? Potentially. Yes, sir, potentially. Uh, same answer, potentially. Yeah, I'd say Fravor. definitely, potentially. Mr. Graves and Fravor, you know, in the event that your encounters had become hostile, would you have, would have, would you have had the capability to defend yourself, your crew, your aircraft? Absolutely not. Sir? No. Is based off of the information that you've been privy to, is there any indication that these UAPs are interested in our nuclear technology and capabilities? Yes. Uh, by external observation, sure, that could be a fair assessment, yeah. Yes. Is there any indication that the Department of Energy is involved in UAP data collection and housing? I don't have an answer. I can't confirm or deny that in a public setting. And no could way. you do it in a, in a secure setting? Yes. Mr. Fravor? No, I don't know. Mr. Chairman, um, you know, I think I'm the last member to go, but there clearly is a threat to the national security of the United States of America. As members of Congress, we have a responsibility to maintain oversight and be aware of these activities so that, if appropriate, we take action. I would encourage the chairman to demand that we have any and all, but in particular Mr. Grush, uh, talk to us in a skiff. And if that access is denied, I will personally volunteer to uh, initiate the Holman Rule against any personnel or any uh, program or any agency that denies ac access to Congress. Mr. Chairman, with that, I will yield the remainder of my time to my fellow colleague from Tennessee, Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ogles, for the great questions, brother. Um, Mr. Grush, 
I might have asked this before, but I want to make sure. Do you have any personal knowledge of someone who's possibly been injured working on legacy UAP reverse engineering? Yes. Okay. Um, how were they injured? Was it is it something like a radioactive type situation or something we didn't understand? I've heard people talk about Havana syndrome type in incidences. What what was your recollection of that? I can't get into the specifics, but you can imagine assessing an, an unknown unknown. Uh, there's a lot of uh, potentialities you can't fully prepare for. How do you think we ought to handle UAP whistleblower complaints like yours in the in the future? Yeah, there was some issue with mine. So, you know, PPD-19 process, it goes to the Intel committees, uh, either through PPD-19 or ICD-120. There's not a good way for the intelligence community inspector general to provide that to other committees. And I asked my information to be sent to the House and Senate Armed Services Committee because there are Title X equities at play, but there was no smooth process okay. to do so. Yeah. That's a trash can. Um, are you aware of any individuals that are participating in reverse engineering programs for non-terrestrial craft? Personally, yes. Do mm -hmm. uh, you know any that would be willing to testify if there were protections for them? Certainly closed door and assurances uh, that breaking their NDA, they're not going to get um, administratively punished for okay. so. Yeah. I yield, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, we're going to do something a little bit out of the ordinary here. We're going to give three people a chance at an additional three minutes. Uh, so, Mr. Burchett, do you want to keep going? Why don't you come back to me, Mr. Chairman? Miss Luna, if she's on, is she on that list? I'm on that. Sure. Uh, Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record an article by News Nation, and it follows uh, Mr. Grush's full interview for the record. Without objection. Thank you, <clears throat> um, Mr. Grush. Why is it that you uh, refer to the phenomenon as non-human intelligence? Why deviate from the basis of extraterrestrial life? I think the phenomenon uh, is uh, uh, very complex, and I like to leave an open mind analytically to specific origin. When you say specific origin, are you referring? Can you elaborate on that for those that might? Not if it's a traditional extraterrestrial origin or something else that uh, we don't quite understand uh, from either a biological or astrophysics perspective, yeah, I just like to l keep an open mind on what it could be. Yeah. Okay, and uh, referring to your News Nation interview, you had referenced uh, specific treaties between governments. Um, Article 3 of the Nuclear Arms Treaty with Russia identifies UAPs. It specifically mentions yep. them. To your knowledge, are there safety measures in place with foreign governments or other superpowers to avoid an escal escalatory situation in the event that a UAP um, malevolent, malevolent event occurs? Uh, yeah, you're referring to actual uh, public treaty in the UN register. Um, it's funny you mention that. Yeah, the agreement on measures to reduce the risk of outbreak of nuclear war signed in 1971. Uh, unclassified treaty publicly available. And if you cite the George Washington uh, University National Security Archives, you will find uh, the declassified in 2013 specific provisions in the specific uh, red line flash message traffic with the specific codes pursuant to Article 3 and Article, uh, also Situation 2, which is in the, the previously classified NSA archive, what I would recommend, and I, I tried to get access, but uh, uh, I got a wall of silence at the White House, uh, was those specific incidents when those um, message traffic was used. I think uh, some scholarship on that would open the door to a further investigation uh, using those publicly available information. Thank you. And then my last question with 51 seconds remaining. You mentioned white-collar crimes potentially being um, taking place in regards to a cover-up. Can you please elaborate? I have concerns based on the interviews I conducted under my official duties of uh, potential violations of the federal acquisition regulations, the FAR. Thank you very much, yep. Chairman. I yield the remainder of my time. Okay, we'll go to Mr. Raskin for three minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chair, um, and I thank the witnesses for their uh, endurance and service today. Um, Mr. Fravor, you've described your episode in detail now, and you call it uh, the most credible UFO sighting in history. Um, 
I wonder, was this the first time that you encountered a, a UFO or a UAP in 2004? Y yes. And what was your general attitude or perspective on the UFO discussion before that happened? I, n I never felt that we were alone with all the planets out there, but I wasn't a UFO person. I wasn't, I wasn't watching History Channel and MUFON and all that. And um, have you had ex experiences or encounters since that happened? No. Um, and so have you formed any general conclusions about what you think you experienced then? Yes. I think what we experienced was like I said, well beyond the material science and the capabilities that we had at the time that we have currently or that we're going to have in the next 10 to 20 years. Very good. M Mr. Grush, um, you've been able to answer in great detail on certain questions and then other things you say you're not able uh, to respond to. Can you just explain where you're drawing the line uh, and what's the basis uh, for that? Yeah, based on my DOPSER security review uh, and what they've determined that is unclassified. I see. So you're answering any questions that just call upon your knowledge of unclassified questions, but anything that relates to classified matters you're not commenting on in this context? In an open session, but happy to participate in a closed session at the right level, yeah. Okay. Um, and Mr. Graves, you said that there are dozens of fellow pilots, military pilots. Are there also commercial pilots who've uh, encountered the same the same kind of sightings that you described before they are similar pilots commercial pilots have uh less range and less sensors to be able to reach out and look for objects over wide swaths of airspace uh, and so pilots are seeing them commercial pilots are seeing them and they're typically closer and the range of what they're seeing is is pretty large well, what is the most vivid concrete sighting with the naked eye um, of the objects that you described before, the cube-like objects? Certainly. I think the most uh, vivid sighting of that would have been near, a, a near midair that we had at the entrance to our working area. One of these objects was uh, completely stationary at the exact entrance uh, to our working areas, uh, not only geographically but also at altitude. So it was right where all the jets are going, essentially, on the eastern seaboard. Uh, the two aircraft flew within about 50 feet of the object, and that was a, a very close visual sighting. And you were in one of the aircraft? I was not. I was there when the pilot landed. Uh, he canceled the mission after, and I was there. Uh, he was in the ready room with all his gear on, with his uh, mouth open, uh, and I asked him what the problem was, and he said he almost hit one of those darn things. He said he was 50 feet away from it? Yes, sir. And his description of the object was consistent with the description you gave us before? A dark gray or a black cube inside of a clear sphere. Inside of a clear sphere? Yes, sir. Um, and with no self-evident propulsion system? No wings, uh, no IR energy coming off of the vehicle, um, nothing tethering it to the ground. And that was, that was primarily what we were experiencing out there. I'm over time. Thank you very much for your service, and I yield back to Mr. Chairman. Very good. Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is for all three of y'all, starting with Mr. Graves. Why did you come forward on this issue? I came forward because I felt that my colleagues did not have a way to mitigate the safety threat, and I wanted to help them. I was trained as an aviation safety officer by the Navy, and this seemed, it just, it just felt right. I felt like I had to help the folks that were still flying and dealing with this. Mr. Grush. Uh, purely a sense of duty. Uh, I first swore an oath when I was a cadet 18 years ago, and I, I still uphold that even out of uniform. Commander. I was pestered uh, by a friend. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked why, and he said, you're the one person that they can't discredit, and you'll add credibility to the New York Times article. And so after about six times, I said, okay. <laughs> yeah. Honest. Yeah. Um, this town isn't uh, made, unfortunately, by people like y'all. We thank y'all. And I do want to also thank the people in the audience and the people that are watching this that can't be people all over the world that have kept this issue alive. You've endured criticism and derogatory remarks and we're trying to get to the bottom of it and so god bless y'all thank y'all so much we really appreciate you guys and gals um, that's why we need term limits y'all keep clapping us politicians just keep talking so um, 
Let me ask you all, how can the public contribute to UAP reporting and what avenues you think are available to the public to report these sightings? Well, right now, I don't think there is a, a lot of uh, public options for the, every man to be able to report on this. Uh, I think even for professionals that have sensor data that are seeing these on a regular basis, they're still hesitant to come forward. Uh, and so for the general public, I think uh, encouraging the conversations that we're having today, looking for technology solutions that can be distributed uh, so that objective data can be gathered is the first place to go. Mr. Grush. Uh, I'll just touch on the whistleblower side of it. I do encourage, you know, current and former military intelligence community and, and industry contractors to come forward in a legal way, either through the IC or DOD or whatever the cognizant IGs are, um, to to lead, me, you know, lead, you know, join me in this discussion. Commander, and I, I guess I should say this for the record: my daddy was united states marine corps first marine division so Hoorah. yes sir he was old school him and chesty puller on pillow so thank oh, you wow. brother <laughs> wow yes sir. Um, i'm not i'm not anything like my daddy he was incredible i'm very mediocre to say the least uh, but go ahead you seem to be doing fine yeah uh for me uh you know i was an accident investigator so the biggest thing you learn and i think that witnesses need to, to do is one don't try and make the fish bigger than it was stick to the facts Write it down and don't speculate what you think it is because it will sway your decision. Just write the facts down. We can get all the facts together and we can start to investigate and get a real honest story instead of it was this big. Thank you all and I want to thank everybody. We made history today. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank you much, Mr. Garcia. Thank you. I know now we're going to be making some closing uh, remarks and so I just wanted to say a few things. First, uh, to our witnesses, I want to thank all of you for, uh, for being here with us today. Uh, I know that um, it takes a lot, a lot of courage. Um, you're telling um, uh, really important information to this committee, and I just want to thank you also for your, all three of you, your service to our country. Um, I also want to just note that today's hearing um, was both important but also serious, and I want to thank our uh, subcommittee chairman, Mr. Groffman, I think, for, for running a very fair and substantive hearing. I do want to thank the committee staff uh, on both sides for uh, the amount of work that it took to put this hearing uh, in place, um, and certainly to all the members that have been uh, involved in this issue prior to, prior to the hearing. I also want to note for our witnesses and for the public that I'm, I'm a freshman member of Congress and I've only been here for seven months, but this is by far the most uh, bipartisan uh, conversation and uh, discussion that I have seen happen um, in the Congress. And I think that um, a topic of this significance as it relates to our national security, um, as it relates to information that we're trying to gather for the, for the, for the American public, uh, does bring people together, and I think that's been really great uh, to see. Um, I think it's also important to note for the public, we, today in our hearing, we had on our side also both our full um, ranking member, which is Mr. Raskin, and our vice ranking member, which is Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, uh, both here at our hearing. I think it shows the importance and seriousness that um, our side of the aisle is taking to this important hearing, but also to the broader issue as it, as it relates to working with our Republican counterparts uh, on this committee. Um, I want to um, additionally add that I think, and I encourage, I think it's really important that we have and continue these discussions and these hearings. Clearly, uh, there's a lot of information that we don't know, um, but it's also very clear that we have to continue our investigation and accountability on asking the right questions and ensuring that they're part of the public record. One thing that was important today is um, some folks might wonder, you um, know, why are we asking questions that might already be out there or that have been asked before? It's important that they're asked and put into the public record as it relates to this committee. And so I want to thank you for, um, you know, answering some questions multiple times. I know not just in maybe meetings you had with some members, but also here uh, in in the public. Let me also just add an additional note uh, that I, it's, it's important also that our um, our, our friends in the media and those that are not just reporting on this hearing, but that have reported on this topic and that may in the future, the media has an important role uh, in this process. And it's very important that the media engages, does independent investigation, uh, and reports on not just what happened today, but what they, what they see independently as what is hap happening with, around UAPs in the broader community. Um, that is also an important um, public a, a benefit that we have in trying to get the information and the facts as it relates uh, 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 to this. Uh, let me also just say finally that as a, as a teacher and an educator and a, a, long time, uh, uh, a long time teacher and researcher um, that I also really believe in following facts, in doing your homework, 
and in making sure that you follow science uh, as, we, as we try to get as most information as possible. And so I want to thank you all for, for agreeing to do that today. Um, transparency is the cornerstone of government. Uh, we live in a, in a vast galaxy, uh, a lot of unanswered questions, and thank you all for being here today. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, I'd like to one more time thank uh, Mr. Birch and Ms. Luna for bringing this to our attention. It's a topic that has interested me since I was in school. Uh, it was a very illuminating uh, hearing. Obviously, I think several of us are going to look forward to uh, getting some answers in a more confidential setting. I assume some legislation will come out of this. Uh, I, I, sure. I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I need to compliment the folks in my office that did a lot of the work on this. Um, Rachel and Noah sitting behind me here. They're very quiet and humble, but if without okay. them, this thing would not have come off like it did, so I apologize. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to want to look into what we can do to make more of this information public. Uh, I think there's certainly a time period after which it should always be made public, and people have been concerned about these issues, like I said, since I was in high school. Um, but in any event, I'd like to thank everybody who was here sticking through, through the entire hearing. Without uh, objection, the members will have five legislative days to submit materials and to submit additional written questions for the witness, witnesses, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. If there's no further business without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>